Hello everybody. Uh, today I wanted to talk a little bit about fencing. It's a question when we get new sheep buyers, that's often one of the first things they ask, even before they ask about the sheep, or they're already sold on the sheep and they just want to know how, we, how you keep them from roaming around the neighborhood. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we decided on the fencing that we decided on. It's not the only way you can go. It's what we did for reasons I'll explain. Um, also, we're over at our adult ram pen. Again, I will explain why later. There's a reason for that. And yes, it is cold. <laughs> In case I look like I'm cold. Um, all right. So first of all, we use standard horse fencing that we buy at Tractor Supply. This fence I put up in 2006, the spring summer of 2006. And we decided on this fence because I thought it was secure and I didn't want the sheep to get their heads through the, the squares. I mean, you've all seen, probably if you research it, you've seen sheep and goat fencing. It has the four inch squares, I believe. Um, these are two by four inch squares, rectangles. Um, that fence works fine too, and it's, it's easier to work with than this. This is stiff and it's very inflexible, for lack of a better word, but it is stronger, depending on how you put it up. So this is four foot tall. If you're gonna have sheep, you don't want it any shorter than that because you can buy it in three foot sections. You can buy it in two foot sections, I think. Uh, probably not horse fence, but you can get other fencing in two foot high. You don't want anything less than four. They do sell five, but um, I've never had an occasion where we needed more than four and five would be impossible to work with, I think, unless you have special equipment. Um, if you're gonna use a fence or any fence usually, you got two options. You've got wooden post and you've got metal T-post. Again, you, these are standard T-post that you'd find at tractor supply or other farm supply stores. Uh, this one has to be really tall. I usually use the six and a half foot because usually, economically speaking, they price out probably the best value. This one I think is seven. <coughs> As you can see, I'm not seven foot tall. Um, couple things you should know about this. First of all, on the working end, I call it, you got these little plates. These have to be completely below the ground when you drive them in. So you can see, if you, do, if you just drive it to the minimum, just so they're just below the ground, that comes out to be 16 inches. Uh, I like to go more than that. I'll show you why in a couple minutes. Uh, these posts, I think, when I put them in, must have been shorter. Maybe they're six foot. Because they're barely four foot tall out of the ground. So you can see they're sticking up above the fence a little bit. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And generally speaking, they've been pretty solid. I probably could have gone deeper with them when I put them in. Which is why I like the six and a half foot fence. So I can put them a full foot and a half in the ground if I want to. So that's 18 inches. Um, did I do the math right on that? Uh, six and a half foot will give you 18 inches and five foot left over. Um, I, I always like to go, I try to get them in two foot in the ground if I can, which is hard, especially the time of year that you do it. Um, in the winter, obviously it's frozen. You can't get through the ground. In the spring, it's the best time. The ground is fully saturated and they go right through like a hot knife through butter. You do not want to put these up in the summer. If you see anybody out installing these in August, they probably need some sort of psychiatric exam because it's just no, it's like driving them in the concrete. So how do you put those in? So we got this little post hole drive, um, also available at Tractor Supply. And you it over the post. All right, so as you can see, I'm reaching way up here. And this is repeatedly dropping it over and over again, um, which I conveniently timed so you couldn't hear what I was saying. But you, <laughs> you, it's it's like it feels like going back to the 1800s when they're installing train tracks or something when you're doing this. How much um, does that thing weigh? Well, I can lift it up with one hand, so 20 pounds, 15, 20 pounds probably. Uh, it has to have weight to it. There's no other way. If it was really light, made out of aluminum, you'd never be able to do this. Um, and that's what you do now. Uh, 
as I said before, the fencing, the quality of the fencing is extremely important, but getting the post in at the correct depth is also important. So like I said, you want to go in at least a foot and a half. So make sure you've got the, the post sticking out at least four feet so they're not below the top of the post and below the top of the fence. Not that it can't, you can, you can do that. Um, and I probably have in a few cases, but not often. It's not really what you want. You want to be able to get the top of the fence snugly secured to the post. And if the post is driven below that, you got several inches of fence sticking up and it's not going to be secured. Probably would be a problem with horses because they'll push down on it. The sheep obviously don't touch the top of it, so it's not really that much of a problem. All right, so that's post and fencing. Now I wanted to talk about the reason we're at the ramp hat. Uh, you can see the corner posts are tricky, and I'll show you what we did for the brands and why we did that. I put wooden posts in. These are pressure treated 4x4s and 2x4s. And I started out with, uh, here's the corner, and then I put this on here so we can brace it. When I stretch the fence, uh, it's secure. If I just put one post in the corner, um, and that stretched it on the other one, I felt like over time the pressure would might warp the post or something. Or break it or something. So I put in the corner is like three posts. Three, four by four stuck in the ground. I dug all these by hand <laughs> with a shovel. So I didn't count how many I have here, but again, these have been in the ground since 2006. So I did all of them then. And there's a lot of them. One, two, three, four, five. So you might ask, why did you do that? Are you clinically insane? And uh, at the time, it didn't seem like such a big deal. It did seem like a big deal, actually. If you're digging this post by hand, you have to go down three feet, at least, to get below the frost line in the winter. And I'll, I can show you that if we can scan around a little bit here in a minute. I didn't get three feet in all cases. I can tell just by the way the post reacted. These held up really well. This one's, I measured it, it's like five feet above, so I got three feet down on this one. And you might say, well, if it got down three feet on one, you could do it on all of them, but it doesn't work that way because you hit stuff. You get below the first foot here, it's all clay after that. And clay is really hard to dig into, especially in June and July when I did this. Because I, so I remember correctly, it was probably about that time frame when I was doing this. Ground's too hard then. Uh, if I tried to do it in April, that would have been a good time probably, uh, but the holes filled with water. So very difficult to put the post in, put concrete in, and then have it settle and uh, cure as much as it uh, That would have been tough. Um, as it was, there was water in the holes, so it wasn't like really, really dry, but really hard to do, and I wouldn't want to do it again, and I wouldn't do it that way again. Just, but getting to the reason why I did that, at that time we had horned ramps. And I thought if I used the normal corner, the T-post, and I'll show you what a what a T-post corner looks like, I thought they might, it might, they might wreak havoc with it. So I didn't do it that way. Um, I don't know, if I were to do it again, I certainly wouldn't do it this way, I'd use T-post. Um, it's just... But you got fold ramps now, so. Yeah, so now we have fold ramps, but I don't know if you can see at the bottoms of the fence, We've got something going on here that we do not have going on with the U's. We would never have going on with the U's. And they pushed it out on the bottom. Uh, and these are the horn ramps that did this. So, in spite of my best intentions, it kind of validated my choice of using a wooden post because they were really rough on the fence. They try to get the grass that's on the other side and they don't have enough inside. Um, so, the problem is, if once that happens, they're cold working the steel so I can bend it back and it won't, it won't be anywhere near as strong now as it was when I first installed it. There's no way to really fix this. I mean I can, like I said I can fix it but if you push down it again it'll come out easier than it did the first time. So the horn rams did this. Um, I also figured out because of that I had to put these wooden cross braces on because they were pushing it out here it, it, for some reason even more in the corners um, and they were actually breaking the fence. Um, they were going to break it open and they would get out. So I put these on. Uh, this was installed afterwards, probably a year later, give or take. Um, 
All right, what I wanted to show is why the posts need to be in the ground as far as I said they have to be. So if you look down the line here, can you see it above that? You can see not only is the fence pushed from the rams at the bottom, they're all, all the posts are tilting. So if I'm if I assume and I don't remember that these are all the same length posts that I showed you earlier, I didn't get them in the ground far enough. So I, I'm presuming that was because it was the ground was too hard. And combination, I think that's from the wind, the wind pushing the post and fence and pushing it down. So I somehow I have to fix that and I haven't decided how to do that. But as I look around the fences that are put up, that, that seems like that happened more often than I would have liked. Uh, mostly on the ram side, the use doesn't seem to be so much of a problem. I think I got a, did a better job getting the post on the ground over there. Kind of talked about what you got to do with T-post and fencing and all that and some of the pitfalls. This is a device I bought recently. I didn't have this back when I did these fences. So some of the newer fence I've used it though. It just measures the distance. So in the back, we had to put up fence last summer because uh, we wanted to get rid of the electro that we were using. And it's, a, it's at least a 300 foot section. It's about 300 foot. So there's no way I could stretch a string tight and and get the correct estimate of distance. So I thought this thing, so I can just walk and measure exactly how many feet it is. So I, first of all, I know I got the right amount of fence. I know exactly how it's spaced the post apart. Um, how do you know that your fence is straight? How do you keep it straight? So once I measure off the distance, then I'll put in some starter posts about um, a third of the way. So like a hundred foot I'll measure off. And then I'll tie a tight string between the two posts. So then I know I've got it lined up right and then I can look. When I'm going 300 foot, you want to make sure it's lined up with the other far post at the end. Otherwise you're going to have a zigzagging fence and it's not going to stretch right. So that's how I do it. I do it in sections where you have to eye it up to make sure you're right uh, in line with the post you're trying to connect to. So I know what the distance is because of this. The string, I tighten and then I just start putting the post in. I just put the bottom of the post against the string because the string's on the ground. A little bit above the ground, maybe this far above the ground. And then I just try and get them vertically straight. It's all eyeball stuff. I don't use a level or any other tools. It's just, and it generally comes out pretty good. It looks really good. How far do you space them, did you say? So, used, I think these are like six foot apart. So I'll go between six and eight foot apart. And so I think if I'm using this fence, you can go farther apart. So I can probably push eight foot, which I have done in some cases. If I'm using the goat fence, which is three inch squares, four inch squares, I like to put them closer together because it's more flexible. And if anything pushes on it, um, they could push it out. It's too, eight foot is just too much, I think. Now, if I was using wooden posts, like some people use, if people drive the post right in the ground, I think you can put them farther apart. Than that. Uh, I like to use those, but they're hard to install and I don't have any way to do it. What else am I missing? Okay, so that's how you measure it. Uh, I'm stretching it. So, stretching it is challenging, but if you don't stretch it right, your whole fence is going to look like this. <laughs> I stretched this right, believe it or not. This was stretched perfectly fine at the time. But like I said, the rams are just, they were, they're not as bad now as they were, because we have bold rams now, but the horn rams are just ridiculous. So what you have to do is, I made this, this is a homemade uh, fence stretcher. Um, and you just take the screws off, put the fence in between them, tighten them back up, and then the fence is caught between here. Put a chain around it. And I used it for this. I think I used the truck because we didn't have a tractor at the time. So I used my pickup truck to stretch them. Just put light tension on it until the fence is. You can tell when it's right. You know, I can't demonstrate that, but um, it's lying on the ground, and then it'll spring up, and you can say, "All right, that's tight enough." 
pull too hard, it's going to pull another post out of the ground at the other end. Uh, or what, what more commonly happens is this T post bends and it becomes horseshoe shaped. If you bend it too much, it'll snap, which I've never done, but I've had them bowled pretty good with the pressure I put on them. But you have to do it, you can't have loose fence. Loose fence will cause, um, well, worst case, the sheep could get underneath it because it's not tight, so they can squeeze right underneath that. Um, the predators could get in too, right? Predators could get in. I think that's those are the worst things. If you had a horse or something, it'd be more of a problem because they're always pushing on fences. Most people, I think, tend to use electric fence for horses now anyway, but this fence is designed for horses. It's got to be tight or they'll just push right through it or push it down. More commonly, they'll push, put their necks over and push it down. Um, for sheep, uh, it hasn't been that much of a problem. Our stayed pretty tight. There's some sections of the fence that have loosened up. There's really no way for me to fix that. I'd have to go through and unhook every hook on the, every post and stretch it again. So, I think that's so, good. So these wooden poles, um, like I said, they've been here since 2006. Some of them have got frost heave, and I don't know if you can see over there, especially, and also in the other corner. If it shows up or not, I don't know. If you can see, they're not really perfectly vertical and not the way they're supposed to be, and that's because I didn't get the post deep enough. So if you walk over and look at them, you can actually see the cement that I put in the ground is actually pushed up above the ground. We're going to go look at that. So we'll look at that, in a second. that didn't work great. Um, and it's just a matter of me not getting it deep enough because, like I said, you're digging with a shovel. It's not the most fun. Especially when you hit a rock like two feet up down. You think you're doing well and you hit a big rock and it's like, oh, all right. Um, all right, so let's take a look at the T-joins. You were talking about corners yeah all right so i mentioned corners setting up corners with t-posts i use these aluminum things you can get at tractor supply they're fairly expensive but i haven't really come up with anything that works better they don't work great but they work better than anything else that i've used so you have to have one set up here and then one set at the bottom and that keeps the post when you're stretching it like i said it pulls and it holds the post in place and then all the pressure's down here and it's going to bend there um if you do it right it won't bend a lot you don't want it to bend too much and break it or you don't want this to like so much pressure it actually bends the aluminum because these are just soft aluminum sleeves so it's a little bit of a more of an art than a science i guess um and again, this is the ram pen, so these have seen better days. Um, but even in a U pen, you can look and you can see most of the most of the ones I put up aren't really holding up as well as maybe I hoped they were going to. There's probably some things I could have done differently, but you know they tend to work better if you get everything aligned perfectly. See how crooked these are. That makes it really hard because when you put pressure on them, they start bending in ways they're not designed to bend. If you get everything perfectly perpendicular and square, they probably work fine, but it's almost impossible to do that. See right there? <laughs> huh? What John's just doing up on the fence. Oh, did you get that? Yeah. All right, so as I said, I didn't get deep enough with these posts when I put them in. If I were to measure this, I don't even know how much I got in the ground because some of it pushed out. You can see the cement at the bottom. Uh, I pour concrete in all the holes, put one bag of cement in each hole. Once I get it, get the post set, put the concrete in, and then I let it dry and then I fill it in with dirt afterwards. And I think I put, more concrete in there than I needed to. But that's not the problem that we have here. 
problem we have here is water's underneath the post because of the water level. And then if, if it's not deep enough, it freezes, and then the ice pushes the post up. It's called frost heave. And that's what happened here. I didn't get deep enough of the post. Water froze underneath it and pushed it up. No, I mean, it pushed it up a lot. The cement came right out of the ground. Um, normally, I don't have that much cement in the, in the hole. I think... I think I knew I didn't get it deep enough, so I put extra cement in the front to hold the fence. It didn't work. Um, might ask why this stupid thing is here. I was just going to ask you that. And you might also ask how many times I've hit my head on this trying to walk through here, and the answer is quite a few times. Uh, the frost heat got so bad that the posts were, instead of being vertical like this, they were spreading like this. I put this in to hold them in place, and actually that worked, surprisingly. Um, so that was a little mitigation that I put in here to try and fix a bad situation. Some of them aren't too bad. This side held up pretty well. And just didn't, this side didn't work as well. Just to get it deep enough. I didn't see the corner also. You've got a similar thing going on over there. Um, they're not, I didn't put them in that way. But you can see they're tipped tilted yeah. and that's frost eve again happening but most of them held up surprisingly well i knew when i put them in there put the wooden post in they weren't going to last forever um the effect, i figured they'd rot and eventually you had to replace them i didn't really ac account for the fact that frost eve would be such a problem but live and learn i guess um that corner over there is held up almost perfectly but you can see the difference in the height too. Obviously I got those posts in the ground a lot deeper than these. As I said again, if I were doing this all over again, and I'm going to have to fix this one of these days, I would have to... I don't even know how I'm going to fix it. At some point I'm going to have to. I'll just have to put teeth posts in and somehow reshape the fence to meet them. I don't really know how I'm going to do it. Um, the alternative is to dig more holes and put more wooden posts in. If I had a post hole digger, which is the way I would do it this time if I did it over again, um, I could get the holes deeper and the post in there, but they'd still have a problem with rotting over time. People say use, uh, uh, what do they say they use? Like the train trestle timbers. They'll last forever if you use those things, but they're just unwieldy. Um, you got to you have the same problem. The holes have to be deep enough so ice doesn't get underneath them. But they'll last forever once you get them in there. If you get them in at the right depth. So that's about all we have here for uh, everything you want to know about fencing. Uh, probably not everything, but I covered as much as I can think of. <laughs> thank so, you. Thank you. Hello, friends. Today I'm going to unbox the Magicraft Little Gem Wheel from its packaging and assemble it. Uh, the little gem is their version of a travel wheel. So very portable, lightweight, and small footprint is sort of the basic uh, position for the little gem. Um, but it does have a ton of features and capabilities. So the way it was designed was, yes, make it small, but also make it so you can spin whatever you want with it. So it can be your main wheel, or you can have it as a like I said, as your travel wheel. The nice thing is too, you can use all the accessories and the kit that you might have purchased like a stylus kit or a lace kit. Um, so all that stuff can be used on the little gem. So I'm gonna get into that in one second. Um, I do wanna just check in with everybody, make sure y'all know I'm thinking about you and appreciate your support of our farm and the channel. One thing I've done that's new this week is on the softshetlingwool.com website, I added a new app that allows people to provide feedback, you know, five stars and comments and stuff. I just added it, and so I'm, I'm still kind of in the, you know, beta phase testing. I'm gonna send an email to anybody that's subscribed to my mailing list, and it's going to ask you to you know rate me based on a past purchase so I think the way the app works is you have to have purchased something in order to provide a, a rating and comments 
So that's going to go out, and that pur purpose of that is twofold. One is just to, if you wanted to leave feedback and just were frustrated because I didn't have that feature, so now you can. So that's one purpose of the email to notify you of that capability and how to do it. But the second thing is just to make sure that you are on my mailing list. I know some people have asked me about fleeces, and what I'm going to do this year is get them all loaded, um, go live on the site, the Soft Shetland Wool site, and then send out a notification via email very, like immediately after letting everyone know that they're now up on the site. So if you want to be on the mailing list and you don't get an email from me about the new feedback feature, get in touch with me and we'll make sure to get you on the mailing list. All right, so let's let's unbox the little gem and then well, I'll put it together. I've never put a little gem together before, so this will be our, you know, first time I've done type thing. All right, so let's, let's dig in. Take off the foam from the top of the package and every little gem comes standard with three black plastic bobbins. There is your manual, assembly manual, and what I believe is going to be the portable lazy cake that you get with your little gem. So this is it. It comes in its own carrying case with a nice strap. So this is what you're gonna use when you take it to your guild meetings or somebody's baby shower or whatever. Okay, so here it is. It's got the pretty um, logo in green. So I'm going to unzip it and see what we get here. rugged um, zipper on this bag. It's going to last forever. Look at that. So there's your base. I'm guessing this is my drive wheel. So here's your Delta Flyer that comes standard and that is compatible with the standard black plastic bobbins. And in this pocket is the stem. your little gem whirl. All right. The bag is really nice. I mean, it's got like some kind of like foam inside of it and it's very thick and very sturdy. And as you saw, the two nice deep pockets for your accessories or whatever. And you could probably just pack your wool right in the little handy bag there. So I like that. That's pretty nifty. Okay. So I am going to open the manual because I am a big manual person. I like to read the directions. So in this bag, like I said, I finished the unboxing, is the um, upper drive band. So you have two bands with your little gem. And these are the pegs for the lazy cake. So we'll put that together in a little bit here. And then they supply you with two Allen wrenches to aid in the assembly. So those will come with your kit also. And then in here, I believe is a nice little... You know what, I'm not gonna tell you what's in here because this is a special little gift pouch with some treasures in it. So I don't wanna spoil the fun. 
and then they give you a spinning manual, which is also something that you can download off the web. And this just sort of goes through a lot of really interesting and helpful information about the wheels and, you know, just really good detailed stuff. But this is what is the manual for assembling your wheel. This is an eight page um, document and I'm going to use it as I, as I go here. We recommend that you find a clear work area where you can lay out all the components for working on them. Your wheel has been assembled at our workshop. It's been tested and it has been spun on. And there's some little wool on a bobbin that they use to spin on. Please unpack with care and retain the packaging. In the box, it's going to be a carry bag with the base assembly in a folded position, which is this. One spinning head with scotch tension mechanism, which is this right here. Three plastic bobbins, one flyer, one traveling lazy Kate, instruction sheet, warranty card, and user's manual. Okay, and then it talks about the bag and unpacking. Okay, all the up components can now be arranged for the assembly. Move the stem to the upright position. All right, so I'm going to unwrap So this, this, this is the second of the bands that you get. This is called the lower band. It's a thicker band than the upper. Okay, move the stem to upright position. Turn the base stem assembly upside down, find the brass slider knob and slide it toward the center of the stem. Okay, so let's do that. I'm feeling a little tentative. This, this is the, uh, the metal piece they're talking about. Okay, well, before I do that, I will show you here that this was signed by Andrew Pode, little gem, LG21-105. So every one of the wheels is signed by a member of the family. Can't get it to go up. All right. Turn the base stem assembly upside down. Find the brass slider knob and slide it toward the center of the stem. So they're talking about this one here. Okay, so it's kind of jiggling back and forth a little bit. Ah! Okay. There was a snap there. So it's in the center of the stem. I think that's what they mean. Find the brass slider knob and slide it towards the center of the stem, out of the locked position. Now turn the base stem assembly the right way up and rotate the spine assembly into the upright position. It will stop against the little metal L bracket.
Okay. So what I needed to do was to slide this the entire way across. Now turn the base. Okay, wait a minute. Okay, so those are the, um, that's the, the L bracket that it was talking about in the manual where it says, Rotate the spine assembly into the upright position. It will stop against the little metal bracket, which is in fact what it did. Turn the base stem assembly round so you were looking at the front of the wheel. I never know what front and back of a wheel is when they say that, but whatever. So I guess turn the base of the, so you are looking at the front of the wheel. Push the brass slider knob away from the center of the stem to lock it into the upright position. Okay, so it's locked. That's unlocked. And that is locked. Insert the head into the base assembly. All right, loosen. Loosen the stem lock knob. Now this is interesting, in the manual, this, they still have the older vision. So in March of 2019, there was an upgrade to the little gem. And the stem used to be on the side. You can see it here in the manual. It was over here. So if you've got an older little gem, you'll know that because your stem is on the side. They've moved that sense into the center. All right, so if you wanna pull, loosen that. So there's enough clearance in the hole to um, be able to slide the stem through. All right. Hold on, hang on a second. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. When the head is in place, tighten the stem lock knob to secure the head into position. Okay. I'm taking it out even, I'm actually, just look at there, I just took it out. And then I'm gonna put the, the nut back in. So there now it's, it's just stopped and I'm just gonna do it that fairly loose. I'm not gonna do it super tight. Okay, the next step is to fit the drive bands. So as I said, we've got a, um, to take this off. We've got a lower drive band and an upper drive band. So there's the lower and here is the upper. Okay. Okay, so that's probably why you'd want to do it a little more than hand tight if you're going to be lifting it by that. And it's really light. So I have a rose, which weighs a lot. This is a lot less. Okay. The thin drive belt, the upper drive belt contained in your green carry bag should be put on first. Put the band in the groove around the very outside of the drive belt. There's only one groove in the drive belt. And then stretch it up over the top pulley. Pretty easy. Really gonna stretch. If plying, now this is interesting, because the treadles are not connected there's no direct connection between the treadles and the um, whorl, or the drive wheel, I mean. You don't, it doesn't not, it's not going to work well when you want to z, z apply by reversing the treadling. On the little gem, you keep your normal forward treadling motion, but what you do to apply in order to get the 
flyer to, to spin the opposite direction is you just twist your top band. That feels super tight. Boy. And then that will allow it to spin to the left. So right now the bands are touching. And so one of the things oops, they say to do is to tilt the head on the gem. So I don't know if you saw me do that, but now the band isn't touching when it's in the plying position. So that's actually kind of a neat feature with a little gem. When you're spinning your single, I'm going to put it back on. You know, the fact that you can move the head so that your flyer is uh, positioned where you want it if you like to spin at you know, certain angles or whatever. All right, so the thin drive belt on the top is done. Talked about plying. This is pretty easy, actually. Fit the lower drive belt next. Firstly, I love that. Firstly, place the belt in the groove on the crank pulley, which is this down here. The crank pulley. So this is your crank. Once the belt is in the drive wheel groove as shown. Okay. Well, we're gonna attach that lower band to this groove here. So we connect it to the pulley on the bottom. This is really easy. So like if you take this to a guild meeting or whatever, you'll have to do this every time and it'll become very routine and easy. It's a little bit clumsy for me just because I'm trying to do it so that you can um, see. So normal spinning. Turn it this way so I have the exact perspective as the picture here. Normal spinning, it's going to come up this way. So for normal spinning, it's going to come up on the back, it's going to be on the right hand side. Isn't that clever? Look at that. Okay. Then, you know, put on your bobbin. And if you have any petroleum jelly, rub a small smear under the shaft. This has already been at the factory, so it's not essential. So now we're gonna slide on our bobbin. I'm gonna use the one that's already got some wool on it. Screw the flyer onto the flyer shaft. So I always um, treadle my flyer on, but I'll do it this way. Tension spring should be positioned leaning to the right hand side, which it's already there. So I'm just going to loosen it a little. Put it on there. Look at the spring is right. Okay. 
So the wheel's ready to go. Okay. Travel Kate. So let's put that together. So it's got two spots to put the rods in for plying. Little rubber feet so it doesn't slide around, which is awfully handy. So yeah, so you you know, this is the travel wheel. So if you're traveling and you're in a position where you want to ply so you can empty up your bobbin so you can get back into spinning, this is handy. It's only got two bobbin capacity, which I've seen people that complain about that, but you can always purchase a, um, a universal lazy cape that gives you the three bobbin, um, three bobbin capacity. The other thing about the little gem, now these, these bits here I just brought for demonstration. These are two jumbo bobbins and uh, or a hybrid flyer, but I just wanted to show that um, I was watching one of their videos and they said that the Lazy Kate actually can handle jumbo bobbins as well. So let's just check that out. And sure enough, yeah, so if you spin on jumbo bobbins on your little gem, they will work on the little lazy Kate that comes with it. This bobbin is really on there, so I'm thinking I want to put a little Vaseline because I'd like to give it a little whirl, give it a shot and see how she spins up. So this is an interesting thing too about the little gem. The treadles, like I said, it's, you know, with the, uh, my rows at any rate, there's joins that connect to the um, rod on the, the drive wheel, right? Where with the little gem, look at how the pedals, they just sort of, sort of ride on the drive mechanism, which turns this, wheel and then when this wheel spins it turns that wheel so it's a it's kind of an innovative design little gems but it was released in 2020 and like i said i think the upgrade came out in 2018 where they shifted some things around um yeah At some point I'd like to get an old little gem because there's something about compatibility with the jumbo bobbins that you have to get a special piece of hardware and I don't know much about that yet so I'm going to investigate that because that has me curious. Okay now sitting here with it it's just so little I can't it's so teeny weeny. All right so let's just play around with it a little bit I'm just going to work the treadle. So yeah, it does feel a little bit different. It feels different because I don't feel it pushing those rods, but it is a real gentle feel. One thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flip the bobbin around because, um, and yeah, it is kind of tricky to treadle in reverse. I'm gonna put the bobbin the other way because it looks as if that's how it was spun when it was tested it seems like it's really grabbing this way. It's a little better.
Oh my gosh, it really does. So this is that whole thing about why you need to flip your band around if you're going to ply on your little gem. Okay, so now I'm going to feed it through. That's one thing I love about the Delta Flyer is just how easy it is to feed stuff through. Last week we talked about this a little bit, how the flyers are balanced to have the hook on the right. Um, which is really not relevant here because we're going to spin in the clockwise direction whether we're doing a single or plying because again the changing the drive band is what's gonna okay, I'm tighten my brake band ever so slightly Twisted around my hook. So yeah, this is um, when I send out new wheels. I always send some of this roving that I'm not really in love with, so that just to give you a chance to kick off the wheel and learn how to get comfortable with it. Which, as you can see here, I'm struggling. So I'm going to break down and put a little Vaseline on there. still can't get over how teeny tiny it is. So I'm going to put some petroleum jelly on the uh, shaft because the bobbin just is really not spinning nice. There's no burrs on it or anything. Standing as a little dab goes a very long way. Let's see if that helps at all. Little. Okay, I've got to install the tension band. Duh. Yeah, see, this is why I like to send stuff. Send wool with my wheels. That's 
of a kind that you just don't really fret about. So as I said, you can take all your other accessories. So if you've got, I, I don't, I didn't, I'm not going to put that hybrid flyer on, but um, it would take the hybrid flyer. It would also take, um, I'm trying to get it to go left so I can loosen it. The stylus kit or any of those lace kit. Yeah, one thing about the Delta Flyer that I had forgotten about is it doesn't really take well if you go off to the side. It gets kind of wobbly, so you really pretty much have to do it straight on. So one thing I want to try now that I got it moving good, I want to try, they, they designed it so you can do, you can twist, move the head to the right or the left, which isn't that big of a deal to me. Another thing that they did is they set it up so you can, if you want, you can lift this stem up and have it be higher, a little higher up by just loosening this knob and then lifting it, tightening it, and there you go. So those are the adjustable features with your little gem. digging it. Hello there. So I got this enormous box in the mail today. Came via UPS. And it is from Thylingers. So this is my comb top order. Which has sort of came just in the nick of time because I have um, the Wafa sale. I have the off sale at the end of the month, and I'm kind of low on fiber, so it could not have come at a better time. And this, I did have them mail this to me. There was no opportunity for a meetup like I did the last time. Um, I do know for the waffle sale, I know my, I have my um, time slot. I just haven't looked at it on a proper computer. I wasn't able to see it off of my phone. Um, but if you want to view the WAFA sales, I believe you have to join that group. And it's WAFA. If you just search on that, I think you might, you'll be able to find it. And it stands for Wool and Fiber Artist Group. And they just started it like right when COVID came and all the fiber festivals got canceled. So, so if you, if you want to be there for the sale, all the stuff I'm going to put up on my website anyways, but if you'd like to participate in the sale and see some of the other vendors and have some fun, it is pretty fun. Then, um, you got to join the group in advance. I'm pretty sure they might've changed that since I did it the last time, but all right, let's take a look at what I got. Cause I seriously do not remember. Um, so yeah, so, next step I have to do is get all these weights, compare it with my inbound because I want to see how I did from a yield standpoint. Um, so here they're telling me what my raw weights are. And I'll go and weigh these all later. I cut the bag as I was opening the box, so I'm distracted by that right now. This looks like a nice egg. 
cool. I don't have this color. Dark gray. They're calling it gray brown. It's pretty. So that's a new color. That's a new color. I don't have this. I had a lighter gray, but not this pretty charcoal color. So that's that. That's a good amount there. This next one is fawn color. Oh, that's pretty. And it's a lot lighter than the fawn that I got before. So I'll somehow code these so it's clear what lot they are and stuff. I'm just trying to remember what went into this. I'm actually gonna go back and look at the video when I drop this off, see if I can remember. And then the last big bag. A lot going on, isn't there? Oh, it's so pretty. This looks very similar to the other brown, but it's probably a little bit lighter. And the reason I keep saying this is I want to just caution those of you that maybe bought some of the colors from the last run, thinking that you can pick up these colors in a project. They're going to be a little bit different. But look at that. Beautiful. Oh my gosh. This looks more like a lighter brown than the other more that I got done. So, I get this weighed. I'm so tired. It's Friday afternoon and I'm just not in the mood for this kind of work, but it's got to get done. So, this is a snippet from the spreadsheet where I monitor my mill spun and mill processed wool. So, what this shows you is I dropped it off in October. Actually, we made, we made the uh, switch off, and I just got it on the 5th. The three colors that I received, and then the next column, outbound ounces, that's how many ounces were the, the raw fleece that I submitted on October 1st. And what I got back was the total ounces. So I sent out 496 ounces, and what came back was 178 ounces. So a pretty high degree of waste. And I don't really know, I mean, some of that's going to be lanolin and dirt. Some of it is I probably could have done a better job sorting the fiber. But, um, so that's something I'm going to keep an eye on and see if I can improve that yield. Because I pay based on the, what goes in, you know, what I submit. So I'm going to monitor that more carefully as we go forward. <laughs> 